22. I was going to say he was young. But, yeah. you know, all, all grandfather talked about was Frank. Frank's going to take over. Frank, 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 Frank was the oldest. Right. Frank was going to do it all at that time, you know. Yeah. It was always Frank. I over here all the mustache fellas. Now, where was this taken? I don't think this was taken here. Although some of the faces are familiar. It looks like Rich Harvey. Yes, that could be. Interesting. These pictures are good. Oh yes, he 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 was quite a person. Quite a person. This this is taken here, whoever this was. This was taken here. Yep. Now here oh yeah, here's Perry, Eric Perry. Two tons. They must this must be an anniversary. Two yeah. tons fiftieth. Got it. Two tons fiftieth. So these are oh here's uh, yeah, here's Penny Halley. I know him. Jack Angel, Jesus, I'm putting names on him now. Penny Halley, Jack Angel, Eric Perry. The rest, Harry Mews, he was mayor of the city. Yeah. He was here, he was at that party. And this is, oh, I know this fellow too. Yeah. This is good. Yeah, that was Penny Halley. There's Eric, a young man here. Get the rose in too, see? <laughs> that was Jack Angel, Patty Halley, <laughs> can't catch the other fellas at all, Harry Views, that's the bear, just imagine recognize him by even by the back of his head, that's him, and this fellow I know, can't put his name on him, and that's Jim Chalker, See, they're great. That's them, I think. That's the store. All lit up, yes. Now, let's see what this one's all about. Boy, I tell you, those faces are all familiar to me. I can't, uh, Charlie Hunt. Yes, sir. He went first class, I'll tell you. He went first class. Ed Sullivan. Sorry, yeah. our picture didn't develop. Best with Ed Sullivan. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, Kitty, that's fantastic. I've actually heard that he was in, he was down for a promotional event with Kodak, and he was at the Ed Sullivan show, and he was actually introduced during one of the shows from the audience. This fellow was in Rochester, you mean? Uh, my great grandfather went to New York yeah. to, uh, for an event with Kodak, with and, Co and they brought him to the show. And apparently, he was introduced on television. Yeah, so yeah. I've been trying to track down that footage. Yeah, but, that'd be uh, right, yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. So here's the store window. These are good. These are good. So these are the type of uh, you know, and I had full sets of, of all this. Um, which has been my starting point, really. See, there's faces here I recognize. I just can't put names on them now. They're gone. They know him, know him, know him. That face familiar. This one's familiar. Love to be able to put names on them for you. Yeah, they're great. They're good to have. They're good to have. I 
believe that was taken in Topsail. They're great. Good. Yeah, so... Okay, we'll take you there. there. So that's been my starting point. Yeah. Well, this yeah. type of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh... And actually, um, some of the 16mm footage I have... Yeah. Um, of him, I, I believe you're presenting him an award. I think I'm sure he was probably... And I, I, I would have to research this. He was a member of the original group of... Uh, the original group. So whether he was a founding member of Rotary or not, I don't know. He might have even been a founding member. That should be researched, looked up. Because a lot of people were at that time. But I know he was involved in, in Rotary very early, in the 29s or the 30s, in okay. the early start. But uh, I can't exactly tell you when he, how he, when he came here. But oh, I got quite a story, quite the history. And I, that history really came from an afternoon when he got all upset. And I was I worked for five years to get the Sunshine Park, the camp, to get it organized, mm -hmm. and it had it had run down totally. It was started for underprivileged children, and he was very involved at that time. And they used to feed as many as fifteen hundred children on a picnic. And I know he was involved at the early start of the uh, that particular camp. Anyway, by the seventy twos. Uh, I was five years working on a secondary, and finally I decided they got to do something with this place. They were doing nothing with it, so basically uh, I uh, got the board of directors and things. After about four years, finding the deeds and finding this and finding that, to, to develop the camp, and uh, have the buildings totally renovated, and eventually turn it over to the city at the Road for Sunshine Park. And when I explained that at one of the meetings, he, he came up for me, got out of his seat. Can't do that, you can't do that. This is for underprivileged children, you know. I dug, I dug that well with my fingernails. I'm, I'm president of 150 people in the thing. I dug that well, you can't do that, see. So anyway, that, I, went, I decided that after that meeting to go down and see him. So I went down and I went up to the second floor, the studio, and he had a Chesterfield up there. And uh, I don't know if it was the office or not, but there was Jesse who was up there. And I sat down and I started from scratch to tell you how, yes, that was exactly for underprivileged children, but now welfare had come in and people were looking after the kids and so on, and there was no longer a need for it, but it still should be developed as a community project, like uh, uh, Bowering Park in the West End, for even children, babies and carriages to the old people who can come and sit in the park. And that's what we were doing. At the end of here, I didn't understand. I didn't know. I didn't know. You know, because he had lost track. In the last year, he was just sitting with his group, not, not involved in what was going on, really. And uh, then he told me the story of how he first came to the, the country. Okay, anyway, how are we going to tackle this thing? Well, or what, what do you want to ask questions, or do you want me to yeah. rave on? Well, I, there's a, I have a couple of yeah. specific things that I'd like to cover, but then yeah. I'd also sort of like to open... The floor to you. I'm, I'm just going to adjust something here because I want to make sure that I have it properly. So. Uh, VO, VO, uh, CM, not VO, CM, yeah. Oh, about 20 years ago. They did, uh, they do, they do two parts of my life, you know. And they did the first part, which is all the family background and so on. Right. And they never did get around to the second half. <laughs> So that's the last time I did some sort of something you do. Yeah, well, um, I mean, you know, first of all, I, I really appreciate you meeting with right, me. Okay. And, uh, and I guess, you know, it, this has been a journey for me. So, so uh, feel free to elaborate on any aspect of um, the history of, you know, my great-grandfather uh, or Teutons, but also, you know, what it was like. To, to be doing business in downtown St. John's and on Water Street, and you know, feel free to to take whatever tangents you may want. Yeah. How um, long do you want this to be? Well, sort of compact press or. Well, what I'll do is I I'll take the um, the you know sort of aspects of the interview with you that uh, that fit with the rest of what I'm doing. Um, okay. Yeah. For the piece, and then I'll edit it together. Yeah. Sure. So you know, it in terms of today. Uh, we can go for as Anywhere. long as you as Anywhere. you want. Yeah. yeah. So um, 
I guess, you know, my first question would be what your earliest recollection of Anthony Teton would be. Oh, I guess that goes way back to the late 20s or the early 30s. And uh, my family, my father and my mother, uh, all were immigrants from Aberdeen, Scotland. And my father came over here in 1910 to work with Nolings. And uh, he joined the artillery and went over with the Newfoundland Regiment. And uh, he was overseas in 1917, I think it was. He was uh, knocked out, and he was in the hospital for about two years. And uh, after that two years, he got off the crutches and the stick and so on. He came back to Newfoundland, and uh, he couldn't maintain his job on the floor as a salesman with Nolings, so he took a job with Bowerings, which was a desk job. And he was Bowerings for a year or so, and he decided to open a store across the street from Bowerings. That would be 1920 when he opened the store. Uh, it was a very cash store, and it really, in one way, it uh, broke into the barter trade, because I remember meeting later in later years, I remember meeting one of the fishing captains, and he was about 84, 85 at that time, and uh, he and my dad were talking about how he was the first fishing vessel that my father convinced to come across the street and buy for cash instead of getting the, uh, just uh, the barter trade, the credit for his fish from the stores, uh, the different uh, buildings or different businesses that bought, and then they, he would get the credit for his fish and then fill up with supplies and take it back to the community. So my father convinced this first, first fisherman to come across and uh, he said, look at these boots. And he said, what, how much are you paying for your boots? Nine ninety five. Same boots, yes, same boots, four ninety five, And he convinced that fisherman to demand cash for his fish. And eventually, fish, uh, fishing vessel after a fishing vessel came across, and we were open six days, six nights a week, and he developed quite a business. He expanded from there on in. But I'd say that was the start of my uh, uh, father as an immigrant from Scotland. And then, of course, uh, Anthony Tuton, I don't know exactly what year he arrived here, but I heard the total story. He told me himself about the story. And I say the late 20s, 29, 28, 29 is when I first met him. And uh, because my father was an immigrant, he was an immigrant. And we used to go once a year to uh, Tony Tuton, as he was known, to his country cottage. And his country cottage was in uh, Topsail on Bursal's Lane, right on the corner. And once a year, we would go out as a family, my mother, my father, my grandmother, and we'd go out there. And I would be around about eight or nine years old at that time, eight, nine or ten years old. And the other family that seemed to be always there that I still remember was the Pete family. And the Pete family, there was a boy and a girl in that family. I think the girl's name was Phyllis, Florence or Phyllis. She'd be, oh, she'd probably be eight or nine years older than I was. She'd probably be 15 or 16. And then her brother would be there, and that's who I would play with. It seemed that the Pete family were there at the same time that we were invited out there. So that goes back on uh, probably the late 20s. That was probably the recollection I have of the early uh, two times, the first time that I probably ran into and met them in those years. Okay. Uh, I guess we jumped from there to when uh, Mr. Tuton told me his whole, whole story of how he arrived. Uh, from Damascus, uh, the ship went into Marseille, France, and uh, on the docks were all the sheets of the fishing vessels out to dry. And the, first, the uh, ship that he was on, he was on his way to New York, really, to uh, go to his brother, his brother who was in New York. So uh, the ship left uh, Marseille, it probably went into Liverpool somewhere, and then it came to St. John's. And coming through the harbour, he saw all this white, on the shores of the, uh, the harbor, and he thought these were the sails. It turned out to be snow. And uh, the story, story he told me was he had only a half uh, sleeve silk shirt on, and uh, the consul for Lebanon at that time was um, the Honorable Harold McPherson, and that was the Royal Stores. So uh, he was introduced to Mr. McPherson. I don't think he spoke any English, or very little English at that time. And Mr. McPherson outfitted him with long johns, underwear, 
and an aviator cap. I remember him telling me he had the aviator cap that came down around his chin. And they treated him so well here that he decided he would stay here. Now that's the story he told me at that particular time. So then he apparently got into uh, photography somehow or other. I think he probably knew about it before. And he had a brownie camera and he used to go down to the regatta and take pictures and sell the pictures. Uh, he opened a little store on Water Street, opposite where Tootun's store was uh, eventually, across the street. And uh, he sold brownie cameras or the film from that location. He didn't speak much English apparently, and across the street in the store that Tootun's eventually had, there was a, a soda fountain. And the story I am told was that Gerald S. Doyle was the soda jerk behind the counter. And he would get letters, Mr. Tutan would get letters from Rochester, the Eastern Kodak, and uh, not being able to read them, he'd take them across to Gerald S. Doyle, the soda jerk behind the counter at that time. Now, this is as I am told. And Mr. Doyle would interpret the letter and explain to him and write the answer. And he'd send it back to uh, Eastman Kodak in Rochester. Eventually, he decided he'd go, take the train, saved up his money, and managed to get to Rochester. And in Rochester, he stayed with Mr. Eastman for three or four days. I think that's how long he was there. And uh, he stayed with the family. And when he left, Eastman had a whole bunch of cartons all made up with uh, film and cameras and things. And it amounted to, I believe, $2,000 at that time. Now, we're going back into the early 30s. And uh, Mr. Turin said, I can't, I can't pay for it. I have no money to pay for it. So uh, Eastman said, don't worry about it. As you get the money, you send the money on to me. So he came back, and uh, uh, he then became more successful with his photography and so on and uh, I think eventually moved across the street where the soda fountain originally was. From there on, of course, uh, Teutons was the photographic place, and Kodak was the big name in uh, Newfoundland at that time. I don't know when it was that he got into X-ray film, but I think that was a big part of his business and part of the, the su success of his business when he sold the X-ray film to all the hospitals. Uh, as I remember, uh, he wasn't too happy with competition because he was a great friend of my father's. They and several others on Water Street, the Patty Halley, uh, who the arcade was, J.M. Devine, the Big Six, my father, Chess Bowden from Aaron Sons. There was about six he used to meet at the Sterling Restaurant every Saturday night and had dinner. And they'd all talk about how business was for the week and what was going on. Uh, eventually, my father was involved with McMurdo's. And uh, there were several directors on that. But my father was the working director and he used to go down when they're building the new uh, McMurdo store, a four-story building on Water Street. He'd go down, leave our office, and go down and check on to see how the building was, was going. And uh, eventually, the building was uh, built. And uh, McMurdo decided that they would go into the photography business and uh, sell a film. So my father was uh, on his regular trips to New York. He went to trip to New York about three or four times a year. On his regular trip, he was to look up and see if he could get some film. So he came back with Ansco film. I can remember the name now. It was Ansco film. And uh, the next thing, of course, McMurdo's had this Ansco film in their windows. And I can remember Mr. Tutan coming down, coming up the stairs into the office and looking at my father and saying, Bobby Innes, my friend, my friend, you would start a, a competition to me? <laughs> uh, my father always liked competition. He felt if they brought more people down to Water Street, it was up to you to get them into your store. So he thought the more successful Water Street was, the more successful his own business was. But I don't think Mr. Tutan at that time sort of appreciated the fact that my, my father, his good friend, had brought in uh, uh, Ansco film at that particular time. Uh, where will I go from there? I believe that Mr. Tutan, I, if he wasn't an original member 
or a founding member of the Rotary Club of St. John's because that was started in 1921. He was very close to it. He may have been a founding member of Rotary, I'm not sure. He was a member of the original group of Rotary and I know that I think he was given the highest award in Rotary which is the Paul Harris Fellowship. Paul Harris Fellow at that particular time. But he was very instrumental with the early Rotarians in developing the uh, Rotary Park at that time, which um, used to look after underprivileged children. Uh, they have fed as much as 1,500, and uh, that was their original job. They take uh, kids in for a week, 10 days, feed them up, and they go back to their homes. But they had these big, huge picnics. And at the same time, they had some very interesting Rotarians at that day that built the club. The Honorable Sam Milley, he uh, put in the pool, the small swimming pool that was out there. And Mr. Tuton, as I said, he said he had uh, dug the uh, well with his own fingernails at that particular time. There was other, uh, there were other brass plaques out at the uh, Rotary Sunshine Park now that shows the people who were involved at that particular time. Chess Pippi was another. And there was a bulldozers group in Rotary, and uh, he was a member of the bulldozers because the uh, Newfoundland tractor had bulldozers. And they took the tractor out there, and they bulldozed part of the property and set it up. There's pictures out there at the Rotary Park, and he very might, very likely could be in one of those pictures, because that would be the in around the late 20s. Uh, that's uh, some of the items that I can remember about uh, Mr. Anthony Tudon. Well-known person. Uh, always had a rose in his lapel. They ate every Saturday night, as I say, at the Sterling restaurant. And uh, a well-known person that contributed terrifically to the community. Other, among other things he did, he built the swimming pool at the, the Victoria Park in the West End. And he was involved with all the community affairs at that particular time. A very well-known person who contributed largely and greatly towards this city. Had a great Rotarian. Okay, that's great. Um, can I ask you one quick technical thing? Go ahead. Do you mind if I switch the camera there for a second to nope. get a different perspective? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, then we'll answer some of your. When we were speaking, um, and you mentioned how uh, uh, my great grandmother uh, Minnie was with your yes. mother. Yes. In Great Britain. Uh, when Frank passed away. When Frank passed away, yes. And it was always interesting because for me, when I heard the story, um, and I, I know it is Great Britain, but uh, I had always, like I mentioned on the phone, heard it, heard that he was in New York, or no, that she was in New York at the time. And it's it's interesting because that's an example of what I've been encountering, which is. Um, you know, contradictory stories yeah. and accounts of, of... Well, this was like the other day I was speaking with somebody and I just can't recall who it was. And he was, oh yes, it was Ron Pumphrey actually. And Ron Pumphrey was talking about your grandfather at that time. And he said, you know, uh, he wasn't able to be here for the funeral. And I corrected him. I said, oh, he was here for the funeral. My father uh, was very involved with the funeral and, and uh, Mr. Tudon. It was Mrs. Tudon that was in Great Britain at the time, because I was, uh, we had gone over the steamship Newfoundland to Liverpool, and we stayed in London, my grandmother, my mother, and myself, and we stayed in uh, some place in Kensington, an apartment, and I was on the way, really, to go to Fettus College in Edinburgh, Scotland. And uh, that particular night, a tele telegram came across, the telegram, well, I think it was from my father to my grandmother, or to my mother, saying that uh, Frank Tuton had passed away and that uh, he was with Mr. Tuton and helping him over the burial and so on. And Mrs. Tuton was in the same apartment. What she was doing there, I have no idea who she was with or whether she was on her own. But I know my grandmother went downstairs and spent the night with her in the apartment in London. That uh, date would be around 30, 35, 36, 1936. And uh, my father being alone, because all the family, we were in London, uh, he stuck around with Tony pretty closely, with Tony Tuton, and helped him through all the burial of Frank at that time. Mm -hmm. That's as far as, that's as much as I know really about the funeral. 
Frank uh, was pretty young, and Mr. Tuton, Anthony Tuton, used to always talk about Frank is going to take over the business. Frank will be taking over the business, and he apparently thought a lot of his eldest son, who was Frank at that time. Right. And so that must have been a tremendous shock to him, obviously. I can't particularly remember. Uh, I had never met Frank. I don't think I ever met Frank, even though we were out in the country house. I can't remember Frank. But uh, it must have been a terrific shock, and I don't know the reason, or I can't remember. Appendicitis. Was it? Yeah, and there was always, uh, when I first remember hearing it, uh, when I was a child, uh, hearing about the passing of Frank, um, uh, it, it was always said that um, my great grandmother felt quite bad because she believed that had she been home, she would have been able we to. We need to help him. Yeah. Very likely. The other thing I just remember a little about, and I don't know whether it was a controversy or not at that time, but I think the question of whether he's going to be buried in a Catholic cemetery or a Protestant cemetery, I think that came up. That's in the back of my memory. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know the answer to it, but I think I'm only recalling probably uh, comments by my father or mother at that particular time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That must have been a very interesting... Oh, yes, that would yeah. be a rough thing, yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, just out of curiosity, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> what was your um, overall impression of Anthony Tudon as a... I, I know you've mentioned your first initial impressions of him, but uh, in terms of his legacy as a business owner in downtown St. John's, um, was there anything distinct or anything that, that you think maybe I should focus on or, or other individuals who come across this story should focus well, on? Well, at that particular time, I don't know who else you would interview, but there must be several people around my age that you should interview to see, get their impressions of what went on. He, he was just, at that time, uh, as was my father, a very successful businessman who had built the business. And uh, this generally happens with immigrants to come over. Mm -hmm. uh, they put everything into their particular thing. I, I'm more involved with the Scottish, I, I'm involved with St. Andrew's Society, with the Scottish background. And I know we had Macintosh, who was the butcher, he was an immigrant. Johnny Brown was a grocer at the west end of the city. Uh, McKinley's was in the garage business. The Eltons were in the garage business. And every one of them were all very successful. Uh, mind you, you must remember that in the 20s and 30s, the population of St. John's was probably about 30,000 people. And I know that for years, probably up to Confederation, if you saw a strange face on the street, you may not know the name, but you knew that it was somebody who came from away. Uh, Water Street was the main shopping center at that time, because uh, I'd say of all the fish that was caught in Newfoundland, 90 cents of every codfish came to Water Street, about six blocks. Very successful street, and the competition was there. But uh, for a city of this size, in those early years, to have four department stores in one city, and of course these department stores weren't only retail stores, they were wholesale business as well. They had distributorship for all the main products that came from the, uh, from the mainland or from well, up to Confederation, uh, the buying was done in New York or in uh, Europe. And it was only after Confederation that we were sort of forced into buying from Canada because of customs duties and so on. But before that, the buyers for the main firms, the Wall Stores, the Air and Sons, and Barings, uh, they were all. Uh, I know Ayers had a buyer that uh, covered the Canada and the States, and they had another buyer who did Europe. But there's only, they only have two buyers. When we came into Confederation and so on, department stores all started to break down into a uh, hardware department and uh, dry goods and electrical work and so on. And uh, the, the theme sort of changed from the original time. But the original firms, they held the retail, the wholesale, distributorship, they had the whole thing in the one place. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore these people were very outstanding people who were successful and who had made it. And Mr. Tudor was certainly one of those. Mm -hmm. And known not only throughout St. John, but probably known throughout the country.
Kodak was the big name, and Two Nuns was the was Kodak. And he had a personality. He had a very strong personality. And I think he was well liked by everybody he met. And uh, if you're in taking pictures at all, the only one place to go is two nuns. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of a monopoly stage in the early years. Right. Yeah. And so um, how did he conduct himself as a businessman? I mean, obviously he focused on one industry, but... Um, did you get the sense that uh, there was a reason for that? That that you know, because there wasn't much diversification, if if any, throughout the years, even when the company was passed on. Um, he, obviously, he was loyal to the industry and he was loyal to Kodak. Um, but oh. do, you, do you think there was some fear of getting involved in other businesses? And no, that may be an odd question. No, no, the, the the part that I would be totally familiar with was the uh, the x-ray business where the x-ray film came in and he was supplying x-ray film to all the hospitals and that went on for many years until uh, uh, sort of a german company came here atlantic films and they managed to pick up some of the uh, the contracts and as i say he didn't particularly like competition <laughs> in those early years and uh, they were a monopoly sort of a monopoly business he had so uh, when the uh, the film started to fall apart in, in the business, I don't know where the business went from then, because then uh, he had passed on, and then uh, Ray had it for a while, and then Jeff took it over for a while. Uh, I know there was an opportunity, I believe at one time, one of the main photographers on the mainland was Blacks. I think they had an opportunity uh, to sell out to blacks, but they didn't take it. Now that's only, I'm only surmising this, I don't know this by facts at all. But uh, while Mr. Tuna had it, it was pretty well a monopoly business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 80%, yeah. E even up until the end. Yeah. Uh, was, you know, yeah. 80% control of market share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, again, for, you'll have to bear with me for. Uh, oh, no, go ahead. For technical reasons. Oh no! <laughs> and I appreciate your uh, your patience. I've done this for you. I've done this for you. <laughs> but if it helps, by all means. Well, it certainly does help, and it helps for uh, for several reasons. Um, not all of which are uh, immediately obvious right now. And, yeah. and um, what's interesting to tell you quickly with the program I'm doing is yeah. uh, I'm actually. Jumping ahead, uh, I, I start my documentary program, but because I've been developing this project, I'm going to start producing it under the tutelage of my teachers. So these are almost like pre preliminary. Jesus, I'll get you back and do our family history. <laughs> because it's much a, a story, much the same, in a different manner, yeah. but much the same. I, uh, I started to shred documents last night because I got four cabinets full of all the, I've saved everything records. I got records of Rotary, records of everything. I started at St. John's Board of Trade and I was president of Rotary the same year as that. And Jeff was the only other one, by the way, that was yeah. president of both at the same time. And I worked at, like a dog for all these things. But I was going through some old files last night and I came across two files. I had spoken, given a speech to the B'nai Brith women and I gave a speech to the War Brides Association. All handwritten, about 10 pages, you know, handwritten. And I started to glance through it. And here I tell the whole story of our family by right, speaking to the war brides because they're immigrants. And I tied that in with my family background, how my father first came here and how my grandmother came. And it's in the middle of that. So I hauled it up yesterday. I said, that should be printed by somebody sometime or even my kids to read because they don't know anything about that at all. Right. And uh, a doctor, as I say, VOWR, VOCM, had done one and a half of my life. <laughs> I never got to say that. <laughs> Anyway, who knows? Yeah. But uh, yeah, whatever, however you want to tackle it. Well, what I think I'm going to do here now is I'm going to yep. just give you. And if by chance, uh, I'm going to be coming back in about a month and a half probably to do more interviews. Good. Would you be interested if uh, need be if to do a follow-up? Oh, sure. Uh, now, my, my fort today is, is music. I'm 86, going on 86 now. <laughs> And I've wow. done 11 performances, and entertainment, I did an hour and a half, entertainment. Yeah. Did it at the Crow's Nest, did it at the Yacht Club, 
did it the McMorris Center, did it the, uh, geez, I don't know where else, but uh, I have a routine uh, with stories and jokes and background and things like that. And I have uh, a sing song in which I wear it, put a different hat on for each song. Okay. Well, geez, they get a kick out of that. <laughs> that sounds fascinating. Oh, yeah. But music, uh, yeah, piano is my background. Piano wow, that's background. excellent. So, um, uh, in terms of, did, did you ever do business uh, directly with, uh, with my great-grandfather? Beyond just... You know, as a no, uh, beyond bringing film in to get developed and things like that, no. His relationship was very close with my father, right? but not necessarily with me. I knew him through the Rotary, and as I was president of Rotary in 1971-72, he was a member of the group that attended every, every Thursday, and he got to know me as a president. But uh, apart from that, I, I just felt part of the... Our family felt part of the Teuton family, let's put it that way, mm -hmm. in those early years. And even uh, Selma, the daughter, uh, I take her to the Tangler's uh, lobster party and to the Tangler's uh, Christmas party every year. So they still do it. I pick her up and take her. But uh, this year, of course, she had uh, an operation. But she's come out of it fine. I think she is now 88 or 89. She's a remarkable woman. And there is another daughter, I think she's Gwen. Uh, Gwen. Gwen yeah. I don't know where Gwen is these days. She's in Ottawa now. Yes, 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 yes. She met up with somebody, I believe. Yeah. She's still with him or not? He passed away. Did he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I remember that particular time because Gwen was at Selma's house on uh, Cornwall Avenue, Cornwall Crest, and we sat on the back veranda. This is going back about eight years ago. That was Gwen, yeah. And Ray, of course, is still in Topsville, mm -hmm. and I think he goes to Florida every year still. Yeah. Yeah. He used to have two big uh, German Shepherd dogs, mm -hmm. and I had a German Shepherd dog. And he was great friends of the people next door, Han, Fred Han. Mm -hmm. And uh, he'd be back and forth during the summer out there. I haven't seen Ray for about a couple of years. I believe he resigned from Rotary three or four years ago. But uh, he's still around. That's Ray, yeah. And Jeff, of course, is, uh, last time I talked with your father, he was uh, thinking of a job here, and he decided that he'd go back to the mainland. So I don't know where he is now. Where is he now? Well, Jeff is here. Did he hear now? Yeah. Okay. Frank is on the mainland. So, Frank is... Oh, Frank! Yeah. Tell you a story about Frank. <laughs> I was, uh, I was in Vancouver. I was chairman of uh, Human Resources and compensation for all the ports of Canada, Vancouver included. And I was going to Vancouver on port business, and I wanted to, at that particular time, to check the ferry service going from uh, Vancouver over to Victoria, because we, I was doing something with the ferry service here for the Board of Trade. So uh, I got the permission to stay over a week and check out the ferry service over there. So anyway, our port meeting was over, and it was, I think, a Sunday, and uh, I wanted to hire a car because I was going to drive from Vancouver over to Victoria, go up as far as Nanaimo, and come back to the horseshoe the other, the other direction. And the, the telephone book was open, the yellow pages, to this uh, rent-a-car. Now, I don't know which one it was. It could have been budget, but it was open on the... Table. So I didn't look, I just phoned up and asked them to set a car over, fine, we set a car over. Over comes the car, and I didn't know who the young man was driving the car. And he gets out and he said, uh, your name is Innes? I said, yeah. Did you live on Topsail Road? I said, yes. He said, I'm Frank Tudor. I said, what are you doing here? Well, he says, I skipped university, going to a university either in Toronto or Ottawa. I skipped university. I only came here two days ago. And uh, I, I don't think even he had phoned home and told the family at that time. I said, well, look, I'm going off to Victoria. I said, I could do it with a driver. How would you like to come and uh, be the driver and we'll take the weekend because it was a Sunday? We said, I only got the job two days ago. I better stay with the job. <laughs> but I remember offering 
the chance, Jake, you're a tuna? Let's go. <laughs> and I took the car and went off for three or four days. But he stayed with the rental car. Uh, I don't know what happened after that. I have no idea. I've met him since. But uh, I get the biggest surprise when I had... Uh, I often thought it was a good job I didn't walk out with the blonde on my arm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he would have appreciated it. <laughs> yeah, he actually came back and worked at the business or at Two Towns for uh, Did he? a while. Yeah, and then left and moved to Halifax, and he still lives there now. So, yeah. Uh, What's he doing? Uh, he's selling life insurance now. Is he? Yeah. 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 So, uh, and he was yeah. doing quite well with it. Yeah. So. Uh, but, um, I think at that time he was a bit of a rebel at that moment that he had left the university. He had, I'm sure he hadn't told the family. Yeah, he was know? at Queens and he left Queens. Yeah. And moved down to, to DC. But I remember often, I, Jesus, I need a driver. And I'm going over and it'll only take two or three days if you're interested in coming by Abbey, you meet a driver. But he said, I've only got the job two days a day. <laughs> he couldn't go. But anyway, that was Frank. Yeah. So, um, did, uh, just out of curiosity as well, did my great-grandfather ever confide anything to you about the, about business or about family or about living here? Um, no, not really. I think our connection, my connection with your grandfather, uh, apart from the family and he being a great friend of my father's, uh, my connection really was through Rotary. Uh, he was a member of the Rotary Club, and I had been president in the 71, 72. And uh, that would be the only connection at that particular time. I know when the city decided to fill in the uh, swimming pool in the Victoria Park, there was a big upset around the city on that one. Mm -hmm. They didn't think that it should be done. But time moves on, and that was it. Yeah. But uh, no, I, I didn't know that. But uh, he certainly knew me, you know. Bobby and his son, and that sort of way. And the picture I gave you there is the remnants of uh, the Sterling restaurant. They did that for years. Uh, on a Saturday night, the stores were open Saturday night, and they'd all, they'd all meet at the table. Mm -hmm. And they discussed business or not. Interesting, some stories were interesting because uh, Patty Halley used to go off buying in New York. And my father did too. I, I think one day they met on the street and uh, one asked the other, you know, when are you leaving? Oh, I'm not going for four or five weeks yet. And they met on the boat the next day. <laughs> Competition, they wouldn't let, let out of who's going first. <laughs> that sort of story goes on. Yeah. And now, I... Um, the other person that you might be interested in, in talking to would be uh, Brendan Devine. Uh, Big Six. Okay. That's his father there. Okay. But uh, I don't know what shape Brendan's in these days. But uh, he's, got a, he's got a vast history of uh, the Big Six. The Big Six store, J.M. Devine ran that. And I have all the records. They brought in the McNulty family one time from Ireland. And they used to play the McNulty records all the time. I got them all downstairs. Still all these records. Wow. These are early records. But I'm in touch with Brendan. And I gave him a picture. Of, like that one of the pictures. I sent that to him. And he phoned, he phoned me up. He didn't get me. And I didn't phone him back after that. But uh, there's a fellow w with recollections because he'd know as much as I did about Mr. Tudor. Okay. So Brendan Devine. Brendan Devine, okay, I'll... I'll yeah, uh... you could check with him. I don't know now what shape he's in. Okay. He's older than I am. Yeah. And uh, once he gets talking, he'd never stop. <laughs> but nevertheless, he would have a, a background on Mr. Okay. Tudor. And uh, I'm trying to think the other one would be John Murphy. Right. John Murphy now has got, between you and I, he's got Parkinson's, he's in pretty okay. poor shape. But uh, his his recollection would be good, because all our, at our ages, it's the short-term memory to get you, yeah. you know. I want you to remember your name tomorrow, right. but I can go back to your grandfather and remember the whole thing. Murphy's in that state at the moment. Okay. But he'd be another person that I would suggest. There's not too many around. Yeah. That would give you a background on your father, unless there's any old employees around. Mm -hmm. That'd be interesting if there's no any employees around. I had the opportunity to meet Jeff Sterling, and oh yeah, Jeff, yeah, I, I yeah. spoke with with him, and he uh, it was quite overwhelming actually. I I didn't anticipate. I mean, I knew they were in business for 
50 years together in yeah, yeah. advertising and whatnot, yeah. but more than 50 years. But I didn't realize the extent to which um, he had an influence on Jeff growing up uh, at the Sterling restaurant. Uh, yes, he would. Because Jeff, my earliest recollection of Jeff at the restaurant was when Jeff was about 12 years old. My father took me down one night, and I don't know how, Jeff must be the same age as I am. But uh, my father took me down to sit with the crowd on a Saturday night when I was downtown. I remember Jeff was about 12, 13, standing by the cash register. Mm -hmm. So he, he would know what went on at the restaurant. But this Miss Jure, she was, they always used to say, is this on the record here? Uh, you want take to take this, it off? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, the Crosby's were all well known. The Bowerings were well known. At that time, there was the East End stores and the Nolings. These were all the main businesses at that day and age. And uh, the principals of these people would be well known. All the principals were well known. And that was the, the time, I think, my father had a car in 1925 or 26. There wouldn't be that many cars around. But I remember in the car, and the uh, motor registration put out the list of the numbers and the people's names. And I knew within a couple of years, I knew every motor car in town. I knew who owned it. And uh, when a car passed, I could tell you what it was. I mean, uh, we've got to go back into a, a simpler city than what we have today. Mm -hmm. I drove up the other night when I was looking at the lights around town. I drove up the top of Signal Hill and looked at it. It was unbelievable. The size of the city in my gen in one generation. How it's, how it's built up in that one generation. It's a huge city now. Very complex, very complicated. But it was everything was simpler in those years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one last question. All right. And then uh, you want to play the music? Go. Or <laughs> are you done? Oh, no, I don't know. Whatever you want. I'd love to get uh, a bit of music if that's possible. Oh, music. There, there was a cameraman down at the Rotary Club. I played for, well, I, I played <coughs> up to about a year and a half ago. I used to play regularly at Rotary. The last 50 years I played at Rotary. But I uh, played for uh, Ed Roberts last week. You know, oh, wow. And uh, he comes in separately from the directors. The directors and the uh, honorary members are paraded in with the sergeant at arms, who happened to be Stephen Duffett. And they have a hack a pick, the old uh, seating pole with the uh, emblem of the rotary on it. And there they pray in first, and there's probably about 15 of them, 12 to 15, of the directors and the uh, honorary members. So, uh, what I used this year to uh, bring them in was the uh, when the saints come marching in. <laughs> and then uh, the sergeant arm goes back to get the governor. So then I play a different one for the, the governor, and I'll play that one for you in a minute. Oh, that'd be excellent. Yeah, play that one for you in a minute. Okay, well, the last question would be, Okay. Um, given what you remember about uh, Anthony Teuton and the type of business person he was, as well as the type of individual he was outside of business, um, what do you think he would, or how do you think he would feel about the turn that the photographic industry has taken and the impact of that. That's a good question. That's like asking me what my grandmother would think of today's television. Because when she came from Aberdeen, Scotland, my bedtime stories were about the lamplighter coming down and lighting the lamps on the street. And when she came here, it turned into electricity. But to bring her back today to look at the television to see what's going on, just amazing. I don't know if she could really uh, accept it or take it. And I think Mr. Tuton today, with the way film is going, and I'm thinking more of film, I'm thinking more of uh, television. What's happened in the television scene, and what's on television, and what's on internet, and the complications of that to a person of that day and age, would be a bit, uh, bit shaking. I think it gets shaken up quite a bit, actually. We sort of accept it in our day. And uh, my uh, internet, I turn that on, and there's probably, if I'm away for a couple of days, there's 130 messages on the thing. And they're all bulk messages, and what I do with them, I look down and see any regular messages from friends, recognize the name, and then I select all, and I delete the whole thing, don't even look at it. But 
today on television the same thing on television today. I think he would be quite shook up to see some of the programs that are on television, which are film, which are film again. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's a different day and age. I think we can only cope with it. I remember an old lady saying to me one time, she was 92, I don't think I can take any more of this. I think it's time for me to go. Could not adjust anymore to what, what's going on today. Right. But uh, within a few years, we'll have internet, we'll have television, we'll have telephones, all in the one outfit. It'll be all amalgamated. It's, it's getting there very fast now. I'd say within five years, 10 years, the whole thing will be integrated into one set. That's it. I was asked uh, oh, a few years ago to make a projection of what would happen in Newfoundland in the next 50 years. I did that all year 2000, I think it was. And I was looking at it, glancing at it last night, most interesting, you know. And I had said in five years ago, I had said that one of the things, uh, the malls will all be warehouses for internet shoppers. And uh, I think that it's going that way now. You've got the shopping channel here, but you'll have the deliveries coming from the local warehouses very fast where it now comes from the original source. And you've gone from now the malls into box stores. And uh, the theme, is, the scene is changing, it's changing. Some people like it, some people don't. Some people, and it's generally the older people who can't adjust as much. I like the mall because I can go to the mall and I can walk through the mall and I'm out of the weather and blah, blah, blah. Now I gotta take a car and go to Walmart and I take a come from Walmart, I gotta go to Home Depot. And I'm out in the, in the, all reasons. But the younger people, no sweat, no sweat. Just get the car. Don't, you don't even think about it. You just do it. Yeah. And that's, I think that's the, the adjustment period would be quite difficult. Mm -hmm. It was quite difficult when somebody came in and took the, uh, the hospital film away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, you know, thanks a lot. I really appreciate oh, it. Oh, you're welcome. And, uh, I hope it'll turn out. I'll, yeah. get, I'll get you back to my family sometime. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm really interested in creating a blueprint of yeah. some sort with this project, and that's been my goal. Yeah. Um, yes, I see what you mean. Yes, yes. You know, yes, so if you get a, uh, yeah, if you get one story mm -hmm. and, and cut property. Well, and, yeah. yeah. And, that's, and that's why I'm at, you know, school. I mean, obviously, I, I'm doing several different things at school. Where are you doing it? Not uh, in, in Toronto. In Toronto, oh, yeah. yeah. Not Ryerson, is it? No, it's at the Toronto Film School. Oh, yes, yeah. And yeah. it's actually owned by an American company out of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's more of um, a practical program. Yeah. So we get in there and we focus as much on the you know specifics of filmmaking, be it audio, editing, camera yes, work, yes, yes, yes. as we do on creating a portfolio. Yeah. So... Um, I got, yes, I see. But because last night I was monkeying around with my uh, digital camera last night. Okay. And the, I haven't even got that down pat yet. But, uh, and the internet, same thing with putting photographs or copy stuff, or I haven't got into that. I just don't have the time. As I say, this has been music. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, I've been concentrating more on music. In fact, I sorted all, look, four cases of music here. Wow. Sorted it all out the other day. Every time you do a performance, you come back. At the end of performance, you put everything together, you junk it, and all you come back, and then you have to sort it out the next day for the yeah. next performance, whatever you're going to do. So you, you must uh, play quite a bit. I, I played a lot, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, I'm having fun doing it too. Excellent. Okay, you get straight in the way there. Uh, so you're going to give us a song? I'll give you something out of this piano here. I don't do too much classical stuff anymore. Although I can do it if I settle, settle, settle down to do it. But I played for the War Brides, you know, I had about 50 War Brides and about 40 other people. I played for the War Brides and that was the most interesting one, Remembrance Week. Oh, really? Because uh, I played 50 war songs and there were no song sheets at all and they sang every one of them because they knew them right from the gut in the early days. Yeah. Uh, played at Remembrance Day down at the Crow's Nest. We had a great sing-song down there. But the women, boy, they just hung the thing beautifully. So is that where my dad would have seen you at the Crow's Nest the last time you, you spoke with him? Or was it at Rotary? I don't know. I can't remember. Not 
On Rotary? I don't know where I've been. Because I remember him, I was home at the time, and I remember him coming home and telling me, yeah, saying how you know great his chat was with you, and uh, I've been meaning to phone you, actually, for the last little while. I was going to phone you from Toronto, but then I thought, yeah. you know, I'd leave it till I got home. But, uh, the Crow's Nest is a neat place. Have you been there? I've been there, yeah. Oh, it is neat. It is neat. I, I only joined it three years ago, but I'm really having, I'm really enjoying that, that Crow's Nest. Yeah, it's a great little spot. So look at this one, the Well, the Crow's Nest is a great little spot. Yeah, I did, I did two things during Christmas there. Had fun doing two. the one I do for this, bringing the governor. You never find it when you want it. Da -da -dee. I'm going to do the entertainer for you first. Do we, I'm going to find that other one for you. Do we, do we.
gotta find that other piece first. Let's grab the paper. Oh, okay. Oh, is that some stuff? No, I, the fingers are sticky. It's oh, it's yeah. stuck. Oh, here it is. Job, but uh, 